What is your passion? Your passion is something that invigorates you. Your passion helps you feel connected to a purpose. You will practically do anything for your passion. When I was a youngster, sports was my passion. I was obsessed with playing football, baseball, basketball, couldn't get enough of it all. And I hoped to be the next Ray Nitschke, Tommy Nobis, Raymond Berry, or Pete Maravich, people you've probably never heard of unless you're my age or older and into sports. But I knew all about these people because they were part of my passion. I then developed a love for theater. And as a young adult, theater became my passion. I majored in theater at Valdosta State College. I did something crazy my junior year because of my passion. I heard that Armstrong State College here in Savannah was going to do The Fantastics, a show I loved. And it had a role in it that I thought would look wonderful on my resume. So I transferred to Armstrong for one quarter to do the show. The show ended, I transferred back to Valdosta State. That's what passions do for you. They give you the strength and motivation to do things you couldn't or wouldn't normally do. Growing up, I had a phobia about going out of town. It was very difficult for me to leave home. It, I would have a kind of anxiety attack. But since theater was my passion, I went off to college to Valdosta because it had a good theater program. After I graduated, this scaredy cat somehow moved to New York to live in an apartment the size of a shoebox so I could pursue my passion. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to do that now. But back then, it was a piece of cake, nothing, because theater was my passion. It helped me do things I wouldn't or couldn't normally do. Your passion helps you do incredible things. After theater, a young woman named Sherry Butcher became my passion. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you too much about that. And the strange, incredible things passion makes you do. I wonder what Jesus' passions were when he was a boy growing up. I don't know. But I do know what his passion was when he was about 30 years old. It was not what I was told it was when I was raised in the church. I was told as a youngster that his passion was getting people to heaven. That wasn't it, folks. A little later, I was told that his passion was dying for our sins. That wasn't it either. Not even close. He died because of our sins, but not for our sins. It wasn't until I went to seminary, studied the Bible, it wasn't even until after seminary and read scholars like Marcus Borg, John Dominic Crossan, that I realized that the story of Jesus had been hijacked. That many of us had been wrong about his passion. It's very, very clear in the Gospels what his passion was. His passion was God and the kingdom of God. Jesus was a Jewish mystic. Mystics being people who have vivid and frequent experiences of the holy, the sacred. If you experience God, the sacred, the holy, especially frequently, God is going to become a passion for you. 
And so when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Notice he didn't say to believe in God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are a lot of people who believe in God who do terrible things. He says to love God. It's not about belief. It's about an experience, a relationship, a kind of a dance even. The kingdom of God is about centering in God as Lord and not centering in the kings and lords of this world, of this culture. It's about what the world would be like if God was king. And that reality, Jesus says, already begins when we make God the center of our lives and not the things of the world. In other words, the dream of God is God's passion for this world. God is passionate about justice, not Marshall Dillon kind of justice, not the punitive or retribution justice we see in our criminal justice system, but fairness, equality, having a system where everyone has enough and no one is taken advantage of. It's not the kind of system where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Since his passion was God and the kingdom of God, Jesus decides to do something out of the ordinary. In fact, extraordinary. Up until now, he has been spending the majority, majority of his time in the countryside of Galilee, the northern part of Israel, where he was teaching and leading fishermen and farmers Peasants, the hard-working people of Galilee. After several years of doing this, he decides that it's time to go to the big city. Time to go south to Jerusalem, which was the seat of political power, religious power, and abusive power. It's where the wealthy landowners lived who were constantly squeezing the peasants off their land. It was common for landowners to lend money to their tenant farmers for 100% interest. And when the peasants were unable to pay, the landowner would foreclose on them. And so the rich got richer and the poor got poor. More and more people were destitute, becoming more and more desperate. And, of course, they longed for change. The Romans were very well, very much aware of this, especially at this time of year when the Jews were celebrating Passover. Passover, remember, was a time of remembering the good old days when the Jews had been enslaved in Egypt, but God, through Moses, led them out of slavery, led them to freedom, and to independence. But those days are gone. The Jews are no longer free. They're under Roman rule. But now it's Passover. It'd be like if we had been taken over by another country, another government, but now we're going to come together and celebrate the 4th of July. And so all of these Jews are coming from all over to pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to remember this special event, this special time when they were free. Jerusalem was packed. I mean, it was like Savannah on St. Patrick's Day or Boston during the Boston Marathon, Atlanta when it hosted the Olympics. People everywhere. That's what it was like in Jerusalem. And they were all Jews who were frustrated, longing for freedom. And that's why the Romans at this time of year would have a military parade. Every Passover, they would send extra troops to Jerusalem, foot soldiers and soldiers on war horses. They'd parade into town, 
letting the people know they were watching them. The governor, Pontius Pilate, who lived in Caesarea, 60 miles away, he'd come over and oversee things to make sure the Jews didn't get out of line. If they did, they would be dealt with by crucifixion. There were faster and cheaper ways to kill people, but it was the best way to deal with rebellions. If someone was seen as a threat to the system, if any people excited the Jews, then the Romans would crucify them. They crucified them because they wanted to humiliate them. They wanted to torture them, and they wanted to strike fear in other Jews. Hey, if it happened to him, it could happen to me. It was the ultimate form of suffering, the ultimate form of humiliation, the ultimate form of intimidation. So on that same day as the Roman military processes from the west, Jesus organizes a different kind of procession from the east. It's clear what this planned demonstration of Jesus means because it's an acting out of a well-known passage from one of the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, Zechariah. Zechariah spoke of two different kinds of kings entering Jerusalem. The king of peace who will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the warrior king who will enter Jerusalem riding on a war horse. And the point is not that Zechariah predicted Palm Sunday. The point is that these are known symbols to Jesus. He would have been familiar with this. He would have known about the royal imperial procession from the west, and he deliberately sets up a counter procession from the east. It's easy to see that there's going to be a problem. If people are shouting, Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, when there's already a king, there's going to be a problem. For if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. The wealthy and powerful will have to do some changing, and they won't. The followers of Jesus exclaim, blessed is the kingdom that is coming. The warrior king riding on a war horse symbolizes a kingdom based upon war, and violence, the kingdom of God, which Jesus represents on the donkey, represents a kingdom of peace, but not just a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of justice. What Jesus did next was the straw that broke the camel's back. The very next day on Monday, tomorrow, he goes to the temple and drives out the money changers who were cheating people, taking advantage of people, making money from the holiday tourists who had traveled to Jerusalem and had, had to make offerings at the temple. And what was Jesus' passion? The kingdom of God, a kingdom of fairness and equality, so he would have none of it. The combination of entering the city in such a provocative manner and then the active assault on the religious establishment pretty much guaranteed that he would be in major trouble unless, of course, he made a hasty return to Galilee. But, of course, he didn't do that. The elites of power and wealth at the top of the established social order had him arrested and executed. He's executed by the very imperial power that he planned a counter-demonstration against today on Palm Sunday. That's what can happen to people when they try to create the kingdom of God on earth. One of the great prophetic voices in the 20th century was the late William Sloan Coffin, who was at Riverside Church in New York, one Palm Sunday, he said, don't believe that Jesus was only a spiritual Messiah and not a political one. That's the great Palm Sunday cop-out that will be proclaimed from pulpits all over the land today. Had Jesus been as non-political as these pulpiteers, these ministers, you can be sure the nails 
would have never grazed his hands. The distinguished rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, religion begins in mysticism and ends in politics. Turning Palm Sunday into Jesus' willingness to die for our sins not only distracts us from his main message of working to bring the kingdom of God on earth, it actually gives us permission not to do it. It's pretty clever of us. We pulled a Tom Sawyer. We got out of the work by not keeping the main thing the main thing. Fortunately, there have been people who kept it the main thing. Oscar Romero, the priest who was assassinated in 1980 for speaking out against poverty and violence and social injustice in El Salvador. People like Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Medgar Evers, and other civil rights leaders who were, were beaten and killed for standing up for the rights of African Americans. People like Harvey Milk, who stood up for the rights of LGBTQ people and who was shot and killed. These folks remind us of what Palm Sunday is really about. Jesus could have chosen a different outcome. He could have run, gone back to Galilee. He could have fought. He could have stirred the crowds to become violent. But remember, that is not the way of the kingdom of God. So he offers nonviolent resistance. Turning the other cheek does not mean you support the abuse. It just means that you don't hit back. It doesn't mean that you don't get angry, that you don't protest. And that's what he did. His nonviolent resistance got him killed. Gandhi must have been reflecting on the life of Christ when he said, to refuse to struggle against the evil of the world is to surrender your humanity. To struggle against the evil of the world with the weapons of the evildoer is to enter your humanity. But to struggle against the evil of the world with the weapons of God is to enter your divinity. And that's what Jesus did. He entered his divinity. And I believe that people who call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, are called to do the same thing and have the same passion. It's not that we don't have other passions. But as we mature in Christ, our ultimate passion should become God and the kingdom of God. And I'm so blessed to be part of a congregation where so many people's passion is God and the kingdom of God. I hear about members of the church who keep banding together to work on people's homes that need repair. And they do it without fanfare or attention or applause. I hear about members preparing and delivering meals and flowers to the sick or the grieving. I go to a hospital room or go to a bedroom where someone is under hospice care and on a side table is an arrangement of flowers, letting the person know that they are remembered and loved. I see the kingdom of God when our members participate in marches and protests for the rights of the oppressed or for common sense gun laws or when I hear about them writing their congressmen. I see it when we host interfaith events celebrating people of all faiths, races, and sexual orientations. And when we open our homes to help and host people from overseas visiting the United States. I see the kingdom of God when we give our special Easter offering to the Savannah Center for the Blind and Low Vision, which does incredible work helping people who are visually impaired. 
and we give, when we give to an emergency fund that helps people keep their electricity or get food to eat or clothes to wear or therapy sessions to help their mind, spirit, and soul. I see it when our green team has events encouraging us to take care of God's natural world. And I could go on and on and on. I am so proud of this congregation. I realize that working for the kingdom of God does not come with the same concerns and fears and dangers that Jesus and the disciples encountered. None of us will be crucified, at least not literally or physically. But any time you speak out or go against the status quo, there are usually sacrifices and consequences. You may have a relative or an old friend who no longer associates with you. You may lose a job. You may lose a fellow church member. And in a society where there are extremists and people with mental disorders, you may even have to spend a lot of money every year to hire police protection for your church and form a safety team as we have done here, something many other churches will not have to do. I am so very, very proud of you, thankful for you. And I know that God is thankful too because you are working for God's passion. Will you bow with me in prayer? Loving and almighty God, we praise you with heart and life and voice, not only with outward signs such as palm branches and loud hosannas, but with an inward desire to be your people and to do what you have called us to do. Help us to spend our time on this planet with a sense of purpose and passion for our lives. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, let us bravely march into our cities and into our neighborhoods and to other people's lives, offering light and love. Open our eyes to the needs of those who are crying out for, for relief from their suffering. Give us the strength and the will to serve them, and give us the grace to discover in our serving the riches of abundant joy. As we begin Holy Week, help us to move from spectator to participant. Help us to take the journey with you so that when we gather here again next week, our lives will be changed. Our lives will be transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.